This is a presentation from the Wapanka Historical Society. Good evening. It's uh, an honor to be here once again, along with my dear wife, Sherry, my computer person. And tonight we're going to discuss how prohibition played out in Wisconsin. And on January 17, 1920, the Volstead Act was enacted to enforce the 18th Amendment. There were many factors that contributed to prohibition, and this evening we'll examine what led up to it. By the late 19th century, the demand for alcohol in the U.S. increased with the tremendous increase in immigration and with the Germans, Irish, British, the, and they all loved their beverages of choice, uh, intoxicants. So with the increase of technology, breweries could increase their production levels and that generated a lot more money. They could ship it further away with the uh, advent of railroad systems and they had refrigerated railroad car cars so they could uh, go really across country and it generated a lot of revenue for them. As a result, the beer barons of Milwaukee uh, really feasted on this being Pabst, Schlitz, Blatz, and Miller. And Milwaukee soon became the beer capital of the world. As competition increased, outlets to sell their beer were getting tougher to find. So with all the money that they had, they went out and they would buy their own uh, taverns or saloons. And they'd buy the building and then they would lease it to bartenders and proprietors so that they could only sell that brewery's beer. So as a result, they were called Tide Houses because they were tied into the brewery that owned the building. Here's an example of four different ones. The major brewers all had their own different types of architecture so that they had distinct uh, different types of uh, the roofs and the fronts so that people could recognize what brewery was uh, what when they'd come to a Tide House. Temperance is the, excuse me, is defined as abstinence from alcoholic drink. And as those brewers were thriving, in the background, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was formed in 1874, had the goal to shut down breweries, saloons, tide houses, and distilleries across the United States. Led by Francis Willard, who eventually gathered over 250,000 members to join, with most signing pledges of abstinence from liquor. They became the most effective political group in the latter decade of, 19, of the 19th century. And she started a campaign which gave women a public voice that they never had before, insisting that the elimination of alcoholic beverages was necessary for the health, welfare, and safety of the American family. Locally, the historic Hutchinson House, which resides in South Park and which was mentioned by Tracy, it's part of the, uh, this organization, stands as a tribute to Julia Hutchinson. It was built in 1854 and Julia lived in it from approximately 1906 until she passed away in 1944. She was very active and dedicated to the cause of the Wapaka's Women's Christian Temperance U Union, which was organized in 1880. 
She served as president for 15 years and also served in numerous local, district, and state office positions. Here's a picture of Julia and a banner for the Wapaka Christian Temperance Union, which uh, still hangs in the Henderson House today. And I thank Tracy for finding these photos for me. She organized the annual state convention in Wapaka in 1908, which had an attendance of over 160 delegates and visitors. The Wapaka Record newspaper reported the meetings were held in the Methodist Church, which proved almost inadequate for the large number of interested spectators. Julia was among the speakers and welcomed the organization which stands for the home and with brave front withstands the great enemy of the home, alcohol. Wapaka businesses were adorned with white and gold uh, streamers and at that convention Julia was elected as the delegate for the national convention in Denver. They uh, had that convention and it was a success and it really helped local businesses all except the saloons. <laughs> Throughout the country Women would gather to pray and parade in streets towards liquor stores, towards saloons, demanding the male owners to abandon their devilish business and pray for redemption. <clears throat> in 1893, the Anti-Saloon League, called the ASL, led by Wayne Wheeler, voiced similar opinions and they became the dominant lobbyist group in the nation's history, the most dominant. They would eventually push prohibition into the Constitution through the use of sustained political campaigns. They would target local elections and support dry candidates to victory. They were very strong. Temperance became symbolic of battles between the Yanks out east and the Germans in the Midwest, urban versus rural residents, and teetotaling Protestants who despised wine drinking Catholics and Jews. So it became a, a big battle and all of these forces grew in intensity. So who would think that they wouldn't agree with each other back then even, right? <laughs> to get the public's attention, one member relied on violence to get her point across. Mm -hmm. Carrie Nation was a six foot tall female that used a hatchet as her weapon of choice to physically walk into and destroy saloons. She would smash mirrors, windows, she would get into their beer lines and slash the beer lines so that the beer would squirt all over the bars and wreak all sorts of havoc in these buildings. She spent 10 years smashing up these saloons throughout the country and was arrested 30 times. When she visited Milwaukee in 1902, she repulsively stated, Back again in the town where all you hear is beer, beer, beer. Is there any place that is hell on earth? It is Milwaukee. <laughs> A favorable recommendation from her. This is one of my favorite pictures of the temperance movement. And as you can see, it says, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. And that's a pretty mean looking gang there. I, I don't know if I'd want to touch their lips or not. <clears throat> so just over 50% of the population lived under some form of dry law. And there was a loophole in dry states where people looking to buy alcohol could go across state lines and buy it where it was able to uh, get purchased legally. In early 1913, the 16th Amendment was ratified, 
which introduced the income tax. The brewers felt that as long as beer taxes poured into the treasury's reserves, prohibition would never come about. But now, with the main source of revenue for the government being income tax, it shed another light on prohibition. And the U.S. government no longer had to rely on tax revenues from the breweries. A few days later, the Webb Kenyon Act was written and bulldozed through by Wayne Wheeler. And Wayne Wheeler really had a lot of pull and uh, he did a lot to lead the country into prohibition. It, this uh, act was approved closing the interstate loophole. So no longer could someone cross state lines and buy the uh, alcohol in a, a legal state. So it was a fatal blow. The U.S. entered World War I on April 6, 1917, and alcohol was banned in the military. Rationing limits were also implemented for the amount of grain supplied to the breweries during the war. And it also sparked inflammatory rhetoric and violence toward German Americans. Wayne Wheeler of the ASL picked this moment to link German treachery with the uh, German American brewers and he would then go on to say saloons were no longer just a moral threat but a political threat because radical political meetings could be held in the saloons. Wheeler was joined by former Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor John Strange who told the German or who told the Milwaukee Journal that he warned against German enemies across the water and the worst of all German en enemies, the most treacherous and the most menacing are Paps, Schlitz, Blatz, and Miller. <laughs> so it really, it was like the perfect storm of the income tax, the world war that led to, uh, in January 16th of 1919, Nebraska legislators voted aye, becoming the 36th and final state needed to appro uh, excuse me, approve prohibition and become the law of the land. The 18th Amendment, or Volstead Act, would outlaw alcohol across the country one year from the ratification date. Individual states had to pass statutes to authorize state and local law enforcement officers to enforce prohibition. <coughs> and Wisconsin dragged their feet on this one. Uh, Wisconsin Governor John Blaine got around to it two years later in 1921 with his signing of the Severson Act. Wisconsinites took advantage of loopholes and liquor retailers promoted people stocking up before prohibition was imposed. So a lot of people would go to their uh, saloons and purchase alcohol so that they didn't know how long prohibition would last but to at least try and weather the storm. So here you got the feds and local law enforcement which sought and destroyed alcohol. So you can see I'm dumping it out of the windows there, out of barrels. And this is my definition of alcohol abuse. <laughs> <coughs> so the breweries had to develop other products in order for them to stay in business. Most of them sold off real estate holdings, including hotels, restaurants, tide houses, and they could hold on. They also made near beer and tonics, which were not well received because they didn't have very good flavors. Some produced a variety of soft drinks and sodas. On this slide, you can see 
uh, malt extract. And this was a loophole that breweries took advantage of so that the public could make their own beer at home. And it was a thick syrup that the breweries produced. And you can see here we got Miller, Schlitz, Blatz, and Pabst Blue Ribbon all made their own. And the uh, homeowner would just add water and yeast and let it ferment for a week or two, and they had beer. So it was a, a good way around it. Schlitz built a sprawling new factory to produce Eline's chocolates and cocoa with the idea that being in Wisconsin, milk produced, or the Wisconsin milk would produce superior chocolate. And on the lower left, you can see the factory they built and uh, the candy bars, the cocoa. And unfortunately, the marketplace didn't agree with the Wisconsin milk chocolate. And the uh, plant closed within 10 years after the opening, still during Prohibition time. Some diversified like Pabst producing dairy products at the Pabst Farms just outside of Milwaukee. And that included Pabst S cheese, which you can see in the upper left. And that was very similar to Velveeta cheese today. Blatz introduced grape gum. They also had their Gold Star ginger ale, which they said was ideal for mixing. Well, you're not supposed to have any alcohol to mix with, right? So, little problem there. And because it was that dry time. The Stevens Point Brewing Company, which was incorporated in 1901, became a bottling franchise for Coca-Cola and produced a variety of their own flavors of soda. They also brewed a non-alcoholic beer called New Brew, a malt tonic and Point Special beverage, which was a near beer. And Point Special still has that name to this day. Point Special Beer. And if you look at the slide here, it's not, no longer called Stevens Point Brewing Company. They had to name it the Stevens Point Beverage Company to get by during Prohibition. In 1928, the feds raided the brewery and found 48 half barrels of beer on shelves in the keggy room. <coughs> How it accidentally got there, we don't know. <laughs> but this appears to be the only time that they violated the law or got caught. <laughs> so in Milwaukee County, nearly all the Tide Houses were closed, but there were hundreds of speakeasies with hidden entrances, back rooms, and basements allowing illegal alcohol sales. Prohibition was selectively enforced by police and ignored by the general public. And that holds true really in the whole state. Uh, there was not strict law enforcement of prohibition. The Roaring Twenties featured women who no longer drank in secret at home and were now being served in these establishments, the speakeasies, along with men. Tables with chairs replaced bar stools and entertainment, dancing, and powder rooms were added to cater to their new customers as the Roaring Twenties entered. Flappers were fashionable young women, fashionable young women, out on the town or speakeasy enjoying themselves and defying conventional standards of behavior. They became very popular. And Grim Natwick, the creator of the populated or popular animated flapper Betty Boop, was born in Wisconsin Rapids. And he's still considered to be a favorite son to this day. And so 
Hi, Betty. <laughs> Prohibition also created black market distribution and organized crime by the likes of Al Capone, John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, and other gangsters. They would head to northern Wisconsin when things got too hot in Illinois. At one point, the Dillinger gang eluded the FBI in a hail of gunfire in a famous shootout at the Little Bohemia Lodge located in Manitowish Waters. Has anyone been up to see that? And it, it's a, a neat old place, and they serve good food, and they have some walls that are just riddled with bullet holes. Capone stated, I make my money by supplying a public demand. But people would cut his harsh grain alcohol with near beer, and it would make them sick. So the, the, whatever he was distilling was not of the greatest quality, but he didn't care because people would purchase it. And uh, I would not doubt if some people died. It had to taste pretty bad. Yeah. The syndicates made no inroads to Milwaukee, but some of the neighborhoods under the cover of night would have a peculiar odor because brewing and distilling were going on. And I know my grandpa Janiszewski had a distillery in his basement. And he would distill at the evening time. And he would have my uncles and aunts deliver booze to his customers so that if they got caught, they wouldn't get arrested. And uh, he had they always said that he had the nicest car in the neighborhood, understandably, but he did get caught and spent some time in prison. I don't, I don't know exactly how long, so true confessions here. So in Door County, there was one individual that stood out, and he was named Dr. Robert Wall. And he learned how to capture yeast and get the same brewing results every time, establishing quality standards for the major brewers throughout the country. And he had an institute with his uh, partner, Henius, and they would have all the brewmasters and brewers from throughout the United States attend it to learn the uh, tricks of brewing beer. And he also wrote three books on brewing, and when Prohibition started, he shuttered this institute and retired to Door County, retired in quotes. <laughs> he purchased a large orchard and farm outside of Fish Creek and continued to experiment with brewing for the next 13 years. The windows on the top of his silo give credence to the story of he allegedly used them as lookouts for the feds <laughs> coming down the highway. So if you take a look, he had four or five windows up there so they could look all over the place. Is that a, a recent picture? Yes. I took this picture maybe two years ago, so it still exists. And again, it's in Fish Creek. So if you want to go up there and take a look. It's there for your taking. When Prohibition ended, he legally reopened his institute in Chicago until he passed away in 1937. This is the Yuleberg Brewing Company. It, the building still exists. It's in Portage. And this was uh, owned by the Yulebergs. My friend Dave Uberg and his grandfather owned it during Prohibition. And they were located directly across the street from the police department. <laughs> and he said they would brew beer every night and never got caught. Now, if you know what brewing smells like, 
you know something was going on. So I'm sure there was something under the table. But then in 1931, so they went on for almost 11 years, and in 1931, the feds came up and busted his uncles, and they spent some prison time. So it's amazing how these stories can unfold and uh, where the police or law enforcement would turn their head. So, Wisconsin voters approved the referendum to amend the Volstead Act in 1926. Wisconsin was pretty progressive, and I'm sure a lot of that was because of the breweries here. And this allowed for the sale of 2.75% alcohol. And in 1929, they also repealed the Wisconsin Prohibition Law Enforcement Act making the state a much wetter place. In 1932, nominee Franklin D. Roosevelt ran for president, proclaiming prohibition had provided the enemies of society with money that would otherwise flow into the people's treasury. So he recognized that the uh, gangsters and mobsters were all making a lot of money and that tax revenue was not coming to the government. There's an article back there uh, and you can take a look afterwards. I have articles <coughs> from here within the uh, Wapaka County Historical Society at Tracy let me share and there's one where FDR in 1914 was for uh, prohibition. So it's amazing how all of a sudden when he's running for president and things were right, he, he went for pro <coughs> the uh, getting rid of prohibition. So uh, they accounted for millions and uh, millions of dollars and correct the stupendous blunder that prohibition was. He was totally against it. In November, he won the election by a landslide. On February 20th, 1933, the 21st Amendment for the repeal of prohibition and the 18th Amendment was passed or by a landslide for the repeal of the 21st Amendment. And the 18th Amendment was passed by Congress. Prohibition officially ended on December 5th, 1933. And former Wisconsin Governor John Blaine, now a U.S. Senator, Sherry, can you flip it? Authored the 21st Amendment to repeal Prohibition so it should be noted that here a few years prior, the same man who signed prohibition into effect in Wisconsin authored the repeal of prohibition nationally. And that was John. In reality, prohibition created a lot of problems. It not only led to organized crime and corruption, but unfortunately forced many restaurants, breweries, and saloons to close their doors throughout Wisconsin and the country. Large breweries were hurt the most, but were able to survive because of the coffers. A total of only 73 Wisconsin breweries did survive, and when Prohibition started, there were somewhere over 200. <coughs> On March 22, 1933, FDR took another step by signing the Colin Harrison Act that allowed people to brew and sell beer in the U.S. as long it was, as it remained below 3.2% alcohol by volume. After signing it, he made his famous remark, I think this would be a good time for a beer. <laughs> The act was enacted on April 7th, which is known and celebrated to this day as National Beer Day. 
On the morning that Prohibition ended, cars lined up and down Water Street by Stevens Point Brewery to take bottles home of Point Beer. They worked around the clock at the brewery for two weeks to keep up with the demand. The locals have always robustly supported the Stevens Point Brewery, and it, that's why it's still around today, and I enjoy their beer. In downtown Milwaukee, there was a huge traffic jam and celebration as Miller and Schlitz had trains loaded with beer enter Milwaukee to celebrate. Over 15,000 revelers rejoiced at the auditorium in Milwaukee, and they drank enough beer to float a, bath, a battleship. <laughs> so celebrate, because happy days are here again. Cheers. So I hope my presentation gives you a better insight of the dynamics of what prohibition was about. So thank you.